My name is David Green. I'm a consultant anaesthetist at King's College Hospital in London. Following the discovery of insulin by Banting and Best, King's has actually specialised in diabetic patients and was the first hospital in England to have a consultant diabetic physician. As a result, we still get a very large number of diabetic patients for major revascularization procedures, and this presents us with many challenges, both surgical and anaesthetic. Well, Mr. B is a classic uh, major vascular patient that we see. He's elderly, aged 81. He has renal impairment. He has some respiratory disease. And he's also, in this instance, anemic with a haemoglobin concentration of round about 100 grams per litre. And what we're concerned about, really, in anaesthesia in this patient is maintenance of the status quo. That is to say, his cardiac output, his blood pressure, um, and his general uh, physiological status. Nice deep breath. What we're achieving with the LIDCO basically is to set one parameter, that's his cardiac output and his blood pressure, and what we're doing is displaying it continuously on the screen. So on the left hand side of the screen we've got his starting blood pressure and his starting cardiac output, which is about 180 over 80 as you can see there, that's mm -hmm. the black portion, um, the red portion is the mean pressure and the purple is the heart rate. That's his cardiac output there, which is running about five litres. Now, the important thing about the LIDCO is calculating stroke volume from pulse power analysis, but it's a cardiac output of the patient preoperatively, pre-induction, his baseline status quo. And what we're really looking is for change when we put him off to sleep. So you can see these various event marks along the top there. A little bit constricted now because we're already one hour into the case, but one indicates we're beginning to give remifentanil, and two is we're beginning to give propofol, which is obviously the intravenous induction agent. Yeah. And what we find is, as every anaesthetist know, the, knows, the blood pressure falls at induction. And you yes. can see here, when we start the propofol, not when we start the remifentanil, there is a decline in blood pressure, yeah. okay, going down here. And we also see that is due primarily to a decline in cardiac output. And if we switch to a screen which, demonst which demonstrates the um, overall trends, yeah. we can see here, this is systemic vascular resistance at the yeah. top. This is our blood pressure trace, which we saw earlier. This was our one and two remifentanil propofol with blood pressure falling. We can see that that fall in blood pressure was not due to a change in systemic vascular resistance. It was due to a change in cardiac output. Now, traditionally, people have assumed that this change in blood pressure is due to a resistance phenomenon rather than the flow phenomenon. Mm. The elderly patient, that is not the case. 90% of the fall in any particular patient is almost always due to a change in cardiac output. Yeah. So let's go back to the original screen just to show that again. Okay. So what we're trying to do basically is we see the fall here and at this point you obviously want to limit the change in, in, in blood pressure and cardiac output. We may have, for example, to give um, fluids if we find that the patient is underfilled. How do we know that? We look at what's called stroke volume variation. Okay? And we can also, if we want to look at this other screen again, we can see changes in stroke volume variation on this screen that following induction this blue line has been running along at just within the level of normal fluid requirements. Mm. So he was never at any stage 
very short of fluid. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, we've got that um, additional information from the leak. So if the blood pressure falls dramatically. There is often a reflex response to pour in fluids into a patient because they think this is due to fluid de depletion. It's not. Or they may, on the other hand, um, for example, give a vasoconstrictor drug like metaraminol to, to raise the blood pressure, which it will do. But we can see here that the fall was nothing to do with systemic vascular resistance. Mm. The fall in blood pressure is a stroke volume related phenomena, allowing you to deal with that. Yes, you asked about conventional monitoring. This is our conventional history screen on our anaesthetic record system showing the blood pressure at the top there. Okay. Yeah. And we've got saturation in, in green there, which is running perfectly, normally 95 to 100 range. What we saw at induction was a fall in blood pressure, which of course was indicated on the LIDCO screen. But with this monitor alone, we don't know whether that fall in blood pressure was due to a systemic vascular resistance change, in which case, if we got worried, an appropriate intervention might be something like metaraminol, or it's a fall in stroke volume and cardiac output, when the metaraminol would be an inappropriate intervention because all it would do is increase systemic vascular resistance when systemic vascular resistance hadn't changed. Mm -hmm. So with the LIDCO it allows us to see what the cause of that fall in blood pressure is because yes. otherwise we don't know whether it's a cardiac output change or a systemic vascular resistance change and in the absence of that information we can't make an appropriate intervention. In addition we might assume that that might be due to fluid depletion so the automatic reflex would be to give fluid. We know from the lid code that the patient wasn't fluid depleted because the stroke volume variation was low. So it allows us to refine our intervention, which this monitoring, the conventional monitoring, does not allow you to do. Because we've, we've described what's happened with the stroke volume, as we're showing here in blue, yeah. or of course we can show cardiac output change, where we saw the fall at induction, and it's now back, as you can see, almost to its pre-induction level, which is what we're trying to achieve throughout the operation. But what we're seeing here is an in obvious increase in stroke volume. The LIDCO allows us, when we start any intervention, to track it by stroke volume change or by cardiac output change over the period that we're doing. And what we started here, actually, at this point, was some phenylephrine. Yeah. It was a patient prior to surgery, and in fact, after, immediately after surgery started, his blood pressure was still a little bit low. Mm. So we started a, a, an infusion of phenylephrine, and you can see two phenomena with phenylephrine. The point we started it, which was about here, we can see the stroke volume variation was on the high side of normal, about yep. 10%. Yep. What it tends to do is to constrict the venous side to decrease stroke volume variation down to 5 from about 9 yep and at the same time increases stroke volume. And you can see the stroke volume change following the beginning of the infusion of phenylephrine has gone up by 20%. It's now, like giving a colloid bolus. It's like giving a bolus, but also giving you some inotropic support to the patient. So not only have we got a change in, um, in blood pressure, as you can see here with phenylephrine, okay, but we've also got an increase in stroke volume. Now this is different to the effect that you would get with metaraminol where you'd get the increase in blood pressure, but you would not get the increase in stroke volume. Often the stroke volume falls. And this allows us to track that change throughout the procedure, and we can adjust the phenylephrine mm. up or down to, keep, to maintain that um, stroke volume that we've got in the cardiac output and the blood pressure. We've also just learnt that this patient's haemoglobin has fallen even further, mm. down to 7.8 grams, and we will probably have to deal with that shortly by giving him some blood. But at the moment, everything is maintained within the normal range. And as you can see, the stroke volume variation is only 3% at this time. There is no need now to give this patient any um, saline-based fluid or colloid, um, and all we're, the only fluid he's getting at the moment is about 100 mils an hour of glucose saline um, to maintain his water balance and his glucose balance and he is a non-insulin dependent diabetic. So again, this allows us to switch the fluid off, yes. which many anaesthetists are reluctant to do. They will run the fluid 
sometimes a litre an hour, irrespective of what's going on. We know now this patient is not short of fluid. We don't need to give him any more, mm -hmm. and we can thus just give him his basic maintenance fluid. Mm -hmm. So when he wakes up, he will not run, in, shouldn't run into problems of, for example, um, going into pulmonary edema or something like that. Well, the whole ethos of what we've done so far in the intraoperative course was really to maintain the patient's normal cardiac output. Remember, the patient was a routine elective case where they had a normal cardiac output which was normal for them. And we don't know, we're not trying to target the patient to nominal values, we're trying to target them to their, the patient's preoperative value. And providing we keep that cardiac output roughly equivalent, say within 10% of the patient's cardiac output <coughs> preoperatively in the intraoperative course, then we're not going to build up an oxygen debt. We don't build an, up an oxygen debt, then postoperatively the patient doesn't have any debt to repay. So what we're looking for now in the postoperative period is to see roughly what the patient's cardiac output was um, in comparison to what it was when we started. We were able to maintain his nominal cardiac output during the procedure at roughly the preoperative levels, and now we see in recovery, um, where we've been for about the last 20 minutes, we can see he's maintaining the cardiac output that we had preoperatively. And what that basically means is that this person would be able to go back to a general ward because we would not have to stimulate his heart or maintain any other sort of normal values. We've kept him very stable during the procedure and despite the fact that he's ASA 3 or 4 and has had just had a six hour procedure, he goes back to a general ward rather than a high dependency unit. And of course, as we all know, spaces on high dependency units are very scarce these days. So maximizing the intraoperative period by new technology, this sort of technology monitoring, means that we limit the need for specialized resources postoperatively which is a major benefit both to the patient, obviously, and to the resources needed in the hospital. One of the crucial features of stroke volume variation, of course, is that ventilation is actually challenging the patient's circulation, positive pressure ventilation. As soon as a patient breathes spontaneously, that facet is lost. So you can't use stroke volume variation, for example, as we have here, as an indicator of the requirement for fluids. But what we do have, of course, is the patient's nominal stroke volume and cardiac output. So if we feel that the patient might require fluid because the stroke volume and cardiac output has fallen in recovery, we can still look at the stroke volume response to fluid, even though the stroke volume variation is no longer giving us meaningful data. So it, as one would do with other cardiac output devices, we give a bolus of fluid and see if the stroke volume increases by 10% we know whether the patient then is responsive. So although we've lost stroke volume variation as an indicator, we still have stroke volume to enable us to guide fluid management in the post-operative period. Yeah, we give the fluid challenge when we see a change in stroke volume variation above mm -hmm. a nominal value of about 10%, mm -hmm. because this implies that as far as the patient's um, right ventricular filling is concerned, it's it's up the slope but not towards the top of the slope so there's obviously room for more fluid. Right. If the stroke volume variation is running at around about 5% it suggests the patient is close to the top of the filling curve and therefore will probably not respond and doesn't need any fluid. Mm -hmm. 
If it's round about 10%, then a fluid challenge is given. Now, how do you give a fluid challenge? Well, optimally, we should give around about 200 to 250 mils mm -hmm. in basically as short a time as possible. Right. And this is best done probably with a 50 mil syringe, where you're drawing 50 mils into the syringe from your fluid bag and then administering really as fast as it will go, mm -hmm. usually into a peripheral vein, that's quite adequate, and then obviously refilled and then emptied again. So 250 mils would then go in over a period of probably about a minute to 90 seconds. The important thing to consider, a fluid challenge is not just turning the drip up and giving, say, 100 mils over five, 10 minutes. That's not a true fluid challenge. Right. So it has to be done almost instantaneously. And what we're looking for, of course, is a dec decline in the stroke volume variation yep. from 10, 15 down to five, and a concomitant increase in stroke volume usually around about 5 to 10 percent. That would be a positive fluid challenge. Okay? A negative fluid challenge would be where no increase in stroke volume occurred. Well I think the the combination obviously of, of, of increased surgical techniques but at the same time our anaesthetic interoperative management has improved the outcome of our peripheral vascular surgical patients. As mentioned, we are undertaking peripheral vascular surgery in high-risk patients who are often diabetics. And our excellent diabetologists have sat up and taken notice that these patients are now doing a lot better than they were doing five or ten years ago. And certainly, using this type of monitoring has meant the patients are much more stable intraoperatively and postoperatively. There is no need for them to go back to a high dependency unit or intensive care unit where they traditionally would have gone. Often, those beds are not available anyway, but they're not required anymore due to the improved management interoperatively. This, of course, has got resource implications, and it also means that these patients can go back to a general ward specialising in vascular surgical patients.